Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our next uh, plenary speaker this morning is uh, Dr. David uh, Pearson from Laurentian University. And his uh, topic this morning is uh, being prepared for the weather of the future. So um, I was given a little write up here. Some people like to have their, their writ, uh, read out, other people don't. But uh, I'm just going to uh, share this with you that uh, Dr. David Pearson is a professor of earth sciences in the School of Environment at Laurentian University. Uh, he teaches in the graduate program in science communication from 1980 to 1986, and he was the project director and then founding director of the Science North, uh, the Science Center in Sudbury. He has hosted two TV series, Understanding the Earth on TV Ontario and Down to Earth uh, Mid-Canada TV, and was Dr. Dave the Scientist from CBC Northern Ontario's weekly radio lab from 82 to 97. Uh, David is a science advisor to the Ontario Centre for Climate Impacts and Adaptation Resources and he has written reports on adapting to the change in climate for several far north communities. So let's hear it for uh, Dr. David Pearson. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, all that history makes me feel whiter and older than I really am. But anyway, <laughs> thank you for uh, for the bio, um, and and it's a really a great pleasure to be um, to be speaking with you here, and an honour to be on the same table as William Sutherland, who I think will um, will will come up quite uh, quite soon to speak from his knowledge of climate change in uh, in Kashashawan. Uh, I'm going to scoot down here so I can push my slides forward. And um, as I do that, I can wave the, um, wave the handout that uh, I think is on all of your tables. There won't be time for me to speak about all of the, um, the impacts of climate change that, uh, that are affecting your community. So I've put a list of them on this one-page handout that uh, will cover the points that I don't have, uh, don't have time for. And, and there are some extra ones here. Thanks, Kim, for, for doing that. Um, <coughs> I was uh, lucky enough on the first day of spring of 2012 to be in Fort Severn. And um, I, I say lucky enough because I like being in Fort Severn. It's a very interesting place, and the people there are friendly and, and always very interesting and good to, uh, good to talk to. And the fish are good, too. So there are lots of assets to, um, to being in Fort Severn, lots of pleasures. Part of what was very interesting about being there was that I experienced a little bit of the, the weather of the, the future. On the first day of spring in Fort Severn, uh, back in um, three years ago, it, uh, it rained and the temperature was plus eight, which is the sort of temperature that Thunder Bay might have been enjoying, but certainly not the temperature that, um, that Fort Severn was used to. Fort Severn at this time of year should be about minus 10, maybe even minus 15, but not plus eight. So it was experiencing um, a spring weather very early in the year. The day before, it had been down in the minus fives and tens, and the next day it was in the minus fives and tens too. It was um, much colder. Those sorts of swings from cold to warm weather in far north communities are part of what you will see more of. And um, just looking at some other of the, the pictures from, from Fort Severn at that time, uh, there was a lot of water gathered in the, in the large channel that, uh, that runs through the community. And the reason that all the water gathered there was that the ground was frozen. That rain had fallen on frozen ground. So unlike rain in the summer, which will sink into the ground because the ground is, is absorbent, uh, late winter ground, frozen solid. It's like rain falling on a parking lot. It, uh, it has to run somewhere. And sometimes it runs into buildings. And there just wasn't quite enough rain in Fort Severn that, uh, that March to run into the, uh, the back of, the, of the, uh, the buildings that you see on the left there uh, or into the tribal council offices, which, uh, which are behind me as I took that, took that photograph. But there was enough for, um, for kids to do a little spontaneous kayaking right in the middle of the, the community. Uh, now, I put this picture in because it shows you the water wasn't very deep. One of the kids is actually paddling in the water. But uh, this might very well have been the, the same kind of weather pattern that Mayor Hobbs spoke about from, from Thunder Bay, which resulted in severe flooding in the community. Fort Severn was lucky. And Fort Severn in the future, and other communities in the, um, in the far north that experience spring rain on frozen winter ground, might not be so lucky either. 
this was a, a fun experience for, for several people, in, uh, the young people in, in Fort Hope, but it might also have been an experience which flooded, um, flooded buildings. So what was the reason for that? And, and what is the signal about the, the reasons for that incoming, that, that, on, that oncoming climate change pattern um, occurring in the, the far north? It has to do with the structure of the atmosphere, not the composition of the gases, although they're involved, and I'll talk about them in a moment, but the structure of the atmosphere. The far north lies right underneath what we call the polar front, the boundary between Arctic air, which is blue in this, this, uh, this picture, and the green mid-latitude air. Here are the Great Lakes, usually covered by green mid-latitude air. There is uh, Hudson Bay, James Bay, usually covered in, uh, in polar air. On March the 22nd, this is what the boundary between those two air masses looked like. It looked like that. This is the pattern of what we call the jet stream, which is the boundary at the height that the jet planes fly of the winds that are at the boundary between the polar air and the mid-latitude air. Now, from a, your distance, I need to point out the Great Lakes here. There is James Bay. And here is the Hudson Bay coast, and there is Fort Seven. There is Fort Seven. Where was the air coming from that was over Fort Seven in that spring? It's coming from down here. Follow these arrows. That was Gulf of Mexico air. Warm air on the opposite side of the, the, polar, the polar front that is usually the air mass that bathes Fort, Fort Seven. What was going on down here in the southwestern states? Where was that air coming from? That air was coming from the north. I don't know for a fact, but I would bet that it was colder down in northern California than it was in, in Fort Seven on March the 22nd. The, the research is showing us that the waviness of that boundary between the polar air and the mid-latitude air is increasing. It's becoming more wavy which means that southern parts of the continent are experiencing polar air to an extent that they haven't in the past, and northern parts of the continent where you live are experiencing warmer air at, at times than they have in the past in certain seasons. And furthermore, it can change very quickly, which is why one day it's minus 10 in Fort Seven, or was minus 10 in Fort Seven in March of 2012, and the next day, plus eight. So that kind of waviness is, uh, is, will, will bring with it, or that increased waviness, will bring with it patterns of cold and warm air that, um, that will bring change to your communities. One of the ways of, of adapting to that, one of the ways of being prepared, is to make sure that the surface drainage in communities is adequate to take away water that falls on frozen ground. Treat your community ground like concrete and imagine where the water will go if it falls on the, the surface of the community in the, uh, in the, the early spring, late, uh, late winter. Uh, this is a photograph from Fort Hope and for, part of what Fort Hope has done to adapt is in fact to make sure that the ditches are cleared in, in late winter. And not just the ditches, but the culverts between the ditches. You all know better than I do how quickly those, the ends of those culverts are bent by skidoos and how they become clogged by debris and how that debris freezes in the, uh, in the culverts. If I was to go back to that picture I showed you of water in Fort Seven in what looked like a lake, I can tell you that the, the conduit behind me as I took the photograph was blocked. That's the reason why Fort Seven almost had a flood in, uh, in March of, of 2012. That culvert was blocked. Um, <laughs> it pays also to think about drainage when new buildings are designed. Um, the building in the background there is, the, is also in Fort Hope. This is the, uh, the health center, the nursing station, and it's the band office in front of me. And the architects for the band office clearly decided that the best kind of uh, drainage for, for that building 
was going to be drainage that the people who worked in the building did for themselves. This is do-it-yourself drainage. Do-it-yourself drainage. That's, that's how the, the water that falls on the frozen ground in spring is drained away from in front of the new band office. In front of the nursing station, there's a terrific drain with boulders in it to make sure that all the water is adequately gathered and the water drains down to Gabonet Lake. And, and that's what you really ought to do. Um, building, building new buildings in a, in a far north community without thinking about the drainage issues in late winter, early spring is really not doing, doing the job properly. Let me go back to, to this again and, and look at another effect. Um, that's a picture from Fort Seven, courtesy of Chris Kustachin. And it's, you can see the date and, the date and you can see the season. This is March of, of 2000 and it's obviously an ice jam. And uh, William Sutherland can speak about ice jams in, uh, on the, uh, the river through Kashashawan um, with, with uh, great authority. Uh, and just to give you some idea of the scale of that, there is the, the river at another time of year. Uh, you can see the height of the banks. I don't quite have in this picture the tree that, um, that's in there, but it's not far away. But you can see the height, the, 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 the extent, the size of that, that ice jam. Now go back again to this picture and consider what happens if there's a river, well, like the Severn River, flowing from south, from south to north. And imagine that the northern part of the river, where the river is flowing into to Hudson Bay and flowing through the community, is covered in, in Arctic air. In other words, this, this convolution, this, this, uh, this bow in, the, in the, the boundary of the two air masses is a little bit further south. So the, the southern part of the river is bathed in warm air, the northern part in cold air, what's going to happen? The, the snow in the southern part of the, uh, the watershed will melt, flow into the river, and, and perhaps if, if certainly if the temperature rise has been considerable, flow into the river in considerable quantity, what do you get? You get breakup in the southern part, but the ice can't get through in the northern part of the river, and what do you end up with? You end up with that. It's easy to understand and with the, the convolutions of the boundary between the polar air and the mid-latitude air becoming greater, and that research is being done at one of the universities in the northeastern states, then this sort of, of um, emergency, or almost emergency, will happen more, more frequently. You all know better than I do, although I do have some experience of this, from the communities I visited, that uh, when the winter road season is becoming shorter. And I think I'm right in saying that it's becoming shorter largely because the winter road season begins later. Winter roads are not now generally passable uh, until quite well into January. And um, uh, the, uh, the freezing of the, the lakes is, um, is, is much later than it, than it has been in the, in the past. It's not so much that the end of the winter road season is, um, is, uh, is, is getting uh, reduced or is becoming earlier. It's that the beginning is becoming later. And part of the reason that the beginning of the winter road season is coming later and part of the reason that climate change will continue that trend has to do with Hudson Bay, the two faces of Hudson Bay. And I want you to remember how different these faces are. You know them already. Especially, you know, the, the frozen face of, of Hudson Bay. And this is the 29th of April. It happens to be 2006, but it could be any April. Indeed, it could be May. And in fact, sometimes it, it, could, be, it could be June. Hudson Bay, James Bay, stay frozen until well into the spring. What are the consequences? Well, the consequences are what I've noted there on the right. Cold onshore breezes, keeping the weather of northern Ontario, the northern part of Ontario, keeping it cold, as far south probably as campus casing. The other face, the ice-free face, the dark face, the warm face of Hudson Bay, it has a very, very different influence on the far north. 
When, when the bay is dark like this, it soaks up energy. All of you know, just from common experience, that if you go outside in the sun in a dark jacket, you will get a lot warmer more quickly than if you go out in a, in a, a light colored, in a white, a white jacket. Because a white jacket, like the ice, will reflect the sun's energy, whereas a dark jacket, the dark water of the bay will absorb the energy. Hudson Bay is warm enough right now in September for you to be able to swim in it. The temperature of Hudson Bay is somewhere in the neighborhood of 9 or 10 degrees, maybe 8, but warm enough to swim in. Now, it won't be a, you know, it won't be swimming pool warm, but it, neither will it be so cold that you would have to get out the second you put your toe in it. And that, that, that temperature in the fall is slowly increasing, and it's, it's slowly slowly Hudson Bay is becoming a greater and greater source of warmth, source of energy for onshore breezes, warm onshore breezes. Now, not, goodness, these are not tropical onshore breezes, but they're warmer onshore breezes than they used to be, warmer onshore breezes onto the, uh, onto the land. Part of the reason that the winter road season starts later is because of this warm face of, of Hudson, Hudson Bay. And these are all special influences on your future climate that have nothing, well, I haven't mentioned greenhouse gases yet. They do have something to do with greenhouse gases because it's the, the, the general global warming that is causing Hudson Bay's ice to, um, to be less and less cover uh, each, um, each year. That global warmth is causing less and less ice on Hudson Bay, and the l less ice on Hudson Bay means all of the, the warm air that we just talked about. So this is a, a, a reinforcing factor for the, for the influence on the climate of the far north that other parts of, of uh, Canada don't get. Now then, the, the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect, of course, is the fundamental global influence on, on changing climate. And I, I don't want to forget it because obviously it's important. But northern Ontario, the part that you live in, has experienced twice the warming, times two the warming of, um, of the global average. And, and part of the reason for that is the, the change in the, the boundary of the polar and the mid-latitude air mass, and partly it's to do with, with Hudson Bay. But fundamentally, it's to do with, with the greenhouse effect. And I just want very simply to, to have you uh, understand how that works. And you were out having your photograph taken in the sun. You were standing in the sun, and you were being warmed by the short wave radiation that comes in from the hot sun. You were also radiating, because that sun warms you, and then you begin to radiate. But you don't radiate the same kind of energy that comes in from the sun you radiate long wave energy, like this building and the trees and the roads and everything out there. Energy is radiated back into the, uh, to the atmosphere and it's long wave radiation and it's that radiation which is captured by gases in the, in the atmosphere. Not all of it, uh, a lot of it gets radiated back out into space, but the, war the, the lower part of the atmosphere that we, in we live in is getting warmer because that re-radiated re energy is being captured. In the higher part of the atmosphere, what we call the stratosphere, is becoming colder because the energy that used to be radiated from the Earth and from us, rocks, etc., is not penetrating into the upper part of the atmosphere like it used to. So the warmer part is getting, the lower part is getting warmer, the upper part is getting colder. And we've got good data from science to, to show that now. Um, <coughs> I want to take you back to, to Fort Hope and, and stress a point that Arlene mentioned about listening to elders and Simon as well. And I might say it's an honor, Simon, to be following you with the, the microphone. I, I've heard you speak at several of these conferences before and Arlene was right about your wisdom. So it's a, a pleasure to be following you. Back to, uh, to Fort Hope, um, 
And when you talk to the elders in, in Fort Hope, and Xavier here did that for me about five years ago, part of what you find is that the, the, uh, the elders, whoops, I've got too quickly under the elders. Um, let me just go back here. That elder story is coming in a moment. The, the, the travel out of Fort Hope, the travel that uh, takes place in winter and in, uh, in summer is, uh, is often across Abermont Lake out to the, to, the Albany, out to the Albany River. And if you're in a boat, you can then go up and down the Albany River. If you're on a skidoo, you can, you can go along the, the, uh, the, the ice-solid parts of the river in the winter. That's the channel that is between Abermont Lake and, uh, and the, the Albany River. That channel is, is becoming less and, and less safe. Uh, and it's becoming less and less safe because the ice in winter is not as solid and as supportive as it, as it used to be, Lance, Xavier, not as supportive as it, it used to be for, uh, for winter travel. And furthermore, in the summer, with warmer summers, and we haven't talked about summers yet, we've focused on winters, in warmer summers, the evaporation of water from Abermet Lake and from land surface and from other lakes, other places, is increasing. For a, well, we don't need to throw in more numbers, but, but that's a, 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 a and, and that is lowering the level of, of the water in the Abermet Lake. Part of what you also need to remember about the north is that you're living on land which is rising. Since Xavier was born in, um, well, since Xavier has lived in, in uh, Fort Hope, the land has risen, if, if this, from about this much, about this much. For those of you who live in Fort Seven, in, in the last two generations, the land has risen from, from here to about here, more than a meter. The reason for that is that 8,000 years ago, this land was covered by two kilometers of ice. It was like a loaded ship. The ice melted away, and it just as it, you take the load off a ship or a barge, the ship rises, so the land is, is rising. And it's still rising at more than a meter a century in, in places like um, Pawanek and, uh, and, and Fort Southern. Over Fort Hope, it's rising less. Even in Sudbury, it's rising by about 35, 38 centimeters every, every 100 years. So that means that in a channel like this, the rocks are are rising toward the surface at the same time as climate change is evaporating the, uh, the water uh, more in the summer than it, than it used to. So part of the reason that one needs to think about climate change is that it adds to other effects. It, climate change doesn't just affect the landscape on its own, it is an addition to other effects that are happening. You need to think of climate change that way. So when you look at, at these old docks, these old structures on the shores of Amount Lake, about this much, about this much that's now out of the water is simply due to the glacial rebound. It's due to that rise after the ice, the ice melted. Part of the rest is, is due to increased evaporation. To my story about elders in Fort Hope and back to Xavier having gathered this knowledge, very, very important to listen to your elders. If you listen to the elders in Fort Hope, they will tell you, uh, four of them uh, talked to, to Xavier and I've talked to one who, who enabled me to put a date on this. Um, they will tell you that in the late 1950s, the community was flooded, severely flooded, to the point where the part of the community, the, the current community that was above water was this patch and out by the, the airport um, airstrip and a little bit down by the park. If you go down to the park today, you can actually find the little dikes that people tried to build in front of their homes that were there at the time to protect them from that rising water. If you ferret around in the bush and the grass and so forth, you'll find little mounds of earth that once were around around homes to protect them. Um, <clears throat> one of the elders in the community remembered that the flood took place in the year before he went to residential school, which pins it down to 1959. 1959 then was a, a year of severe flooding in, in Fort Hope. 
And in fact, when you look at the elevations, you look at the, um, well, there was a, a potato cellar here that was, that was flooded. That potato cellar is about fifth, between 15 and 20 feet above the, the, current, the current water level. This was not just a, a, minor, a minor flood. This was a severe flood. And when you look at Fort Hope of today, Fort Hope was um, expanded in 1992, 1994 with the addition of buildings on that very land that was flooded in, in 1959, just 33 years, 33 years earlier. Now, maybe the, um, the, the, the approval of those, those buildings, the approval of the expansion of the community was done with knowledge of that flood in 1959. I'm not sure. I, I, I haven't been told that it was. When you look to what the cause might have been, you go downstream about 200 kilometers to uh, Lake St. Joseph. What you find, and I, I realize that even from close up, this is a, a mess of colored lines and so forth, but you can see these very tall blue lines especially this one. This one indicates outflow from Lake St. Joseph of water into the Albany River about 200 kilometers south, in other words, uh, upstream from, uh, from Fort Hope. It, it looks like, and this, is, this, this, uh, this peak, this volume of water, is about three times as much as the normal volume of, uh, of water flowing out from Lake St. Joseph. This is the volume of water flowing in. And the volume of water flowing in was more than three times, four or five times as much as the, the normal, if you follow that blue line. It seems that in 1959, there was a, a severe weather event. It was in May. So it may have been uh, that kind of rainfall in late winter falling on frozen ground and the water flowing into to Lake St. Joseph and then down downstream to, to Fort Hope, it might have been the, what you can call the Fort Seven effect, and that frozen ground effect. I don't know. It may have had something to do with the release of water from the, the hydro structures in uh, Lake St. Joseph and also Lac Searle down, down there. I, I don't know the answer to that, uh, to that yet, but we're very interested in, in finding out. It might have been an event like this. This wasn't mid-May, and it wasn't 1959, it was 2002. It was early June, um, and it's the track of a s succession of severe thunderstorms that, uh, that went across southern, uh, the southern part of the far north. Uh, Fort Hope and Martin Falls are right at the top of that picture, just about 200 kilometers north of the track of that, um, that Rainy River event. That Rainy River event is what washed out the road at Wawa, for example, if some of you have seen those, those pictures. Just huge washouts, huge runoff, quick runoff, rapid runoff, very, very, very erosive. What one needs to ask oneself, first one asks oneself, was this the kind of event that led to the, the flooding of Fort Hope in 1959? If it was, if it was a, a one of nature's events and it wasn't caused by uh, by release of water from the, the hydrostructures and therefore was out of control of, um, of uh, the, uh, the hydrodam people. If this was a natural event, might that occur again? What I'm also interested in finding out is what impact there might have been in Martin Falls in 1959, because Martin Falls is not far downstream from, from, uh, from Fort Hope. So if there are any of you here from Martin Falls, I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to chat. In other words, we don't know the details of this event yet. But we do know, we do know that it seems that Fort Hope was expanded in 1992 under land that had been flooded 33 years earlier by a severe flood, and that maybe, maybe it's still vulnerable now to exactly that sort of, sort of event. Part of what I think the message is that comes out of this is that in consideration of your community-based land use planning with MNR, you need to have climate change in the terms of reference. Terms of reference which do not include climate change are neglecting the potential impact of severe events like this, which were real. 
This is not an imported model from southern Ontario. This is northern Ontario, far northern Ontario, experience of the elders and good science. Thinking of severe storms, part of what you also need to be thinking of for the future is if development takes place, if mining development takes place, you do not want events like this to happen. This, um, this is the, the waste powder rock, the so-called tailings, that were accumulated from the Mount Polly gold mine up to 2014. This is, imagine this is powdered rock that comes from the crushing process of the, the gold ore. The gold is extracted, one's left with a lot of powdered waste, which is pumped out into the tailings piles like this. It's pumped out of the slurry with water. And if those, those dams around it are, are not properly maintained, if there's too much tailings put in, or, or if there is a violent rain event, this is what happens. The tailings dam is breached, and where do the tailings go? They go into rivers and lakes. Now, this doesn't happen every time, by any means. But every year, there are two or three or four tailings dams around the world that burst for one reason or another. And often it's because of severe rain events, the sort of rain event that the Rainy River event was. So, imagine 2071. And one of those rainy river, those severe events that affected Fort Hope in 1959, that affected the, 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 uh, the road near Wawa in uh, 2002. Imagine one of those sweeps across the far north. You need to be sure, you need to be sure, everybody responsible needs to be sure that they do their due diligence and they make sure as damned as they can, as fully as they can, that those tailings impoundments will hold the tailings. Part of what's, just briefly mentioning, part of what's attractive about Noron's proposal is that they plan to put the tailings back under their underground and their waste rock, which means that this, this problem for their mine should not, should not occur. But beware of, of, um, of the potential impact of climate change, of more severe storms sweeping through your, um, your traditional territories, your homelands, in, uh, in the future. Normal summer storms, just coming to an end quickly because William needs some time too. Normal summer storms, normal storm events, not severe storm events like the Rainy River event, also need to be thought about, this kind of, this kind of rainstorm. Part of what um, Xavier was able to do in Fort Hope, which all of you should do in your communities, was to map on to a, to a map of the communities where normal flooding occurs when there's a storm. Whose homes get flooded? Which roads get flooded? And what this becomes is it becomes the basis for a plan for, for dealing with the drainage issues in a, in a community. In other words, preparing for some of the impacts, the community impacts of climate change is not rocket science. It's plain, simple, day-to-day -day community engineering, making sure your surface drainage and your stormwater drainage is, is adequate. Stormwater drainage for severe storms is a lot more expensive than simply going along around these, these spots and with, a, with a backhoe. And I think that all northern communities, and maybe this would be groups of tribal councils or maybe it's owned by a watershed, ought to be asking <coughs> for support for stormwater drainage studies and potentially for the improvement of their stormwater drainage, drainage systems. Not these ordinary water, these ordinary storm drainage systems, but the severe storm drainage systems. And fires, of course. Not much you can do to prepare for fires, except that, just like fires and floods, there needs to be an emergency system that will get people out of the community. In the case of Fort Hope, there were people evacuated in 2006 from a fire that was about six kilometers from the, from the community along Pioneer Road. It wasn't the fire that was the, the danger, but the smoke, for the smoke with people with asthma and with breathing problems. People were, uh, were evacuated. 
you need to make sure that those evacuation plans are up to date, that you know the nursing station knows exactly who will need to be evacuated most quickly if there is a threat like, like this. And increased fires in the summer are a, are a consequence of, of climate change too. Increased evaporation from lakes also means increased evaporation from the ground, from, uh, from fallen timber and so forth, from the brush. Uh, the drier the brush, the more likely it is to, uh, to, to burst into flames when there's a lightning strike. Part of what will also happen, which in a way is, is, is certainly less threatening than fires and smoke and so forth, are infestations of, of bugs. This is back up in, in Fort Seven, canker worms or inchworms, there's a spring and a fall inchworm. And the point about them is that they survive through the winter. These are not moths that fly up in the, in the summer, in the warm summer, but the eggs or the pupae, depending on which, whether it's fall or winter, canker worms survive the winter. As the winter becomes warmer, more and more insects that depend upon uh, surviving the winter will appear in your northern communities. One of those that might appear, but not next year, but in the future is, is the black legged tick with Lyme disease. Now, you might, you might look at the lines here and say, well, it's gonna be 2050 before many of our communities are affected. But remember that some of your community members go south, might go south to hunt, or they might go visit relatives and they might hunt. And they might bring back uh, a, a, a Lyme disease from a black legged tick that, that um, hit them in another part of the, of the north. Your health units, your nursing stations, need to be ready to identify the sort of red ring around the bite that uh, is typical of, of a black-legged tick bite that might lead to, to Lyme disease. Part of what you also need to be figuring is that your part of the far north, or your part of the planet, I should say, is one of the parts of the planet that will warm the most in the next generation or two because of the melting of the ice on on, uh, on Hudson Bay, which has been acted. The ice on Hudson Bay, and Hudson Bay itself, is like living next to a, an open freezer door. But as the, the warmth inside the freezer grows, and Hudson Bay becomes less and less like a, an open freezer door, then so the, the global temperature rise will be reinforced by the lack of the cooling effect from, from Hudson Bay. The red colors here, the dark red in the middle of Hudson Bay, representing nine degrees, eight degrees, that's a huge rise. The difference between the average temperature in Thunder Bay now and the average temperature in Thunder Bay when we were covered here by a kilometer of ice in the ice age is somewhere between five and seven degrees. So we've warmed between five and seven degrees since the ice age. The prediction for the later part of the century for Hudson Bay is greater than that. These are huge increases, huge increases. And it seems to me totally incomprehensible that MNR should be leading a planning exercise which doesn't have climate change in the terms of reference for every community. It's a basic requirement for thinking about the future of the land in your communities. Here are the, uh, the seasonal projections, uh, at least the winter and the summer, coming from a very good physics lab at the University of Toronto. And the red colors, again, representing the, the greatest increase in temperature, so five degrees. Uh, Webequay here, Fort Seven there, um, uh, Fort Hope here, and, and uh, Constance Lake down in the, in the south. Those are the, the, the greatest change will occur in winter which is why those insects will survive the winter, including one of those that's coming in from the west, the mountain pine beetle, which is gonna do a job on, on the jack pine, which is a genetic relative of the lodgepole pine. Part of what you also need to do, I think, uh, and I'm becoming a, a bit more professorial here, I suppose, rather than describing the, the effects which science tells us will take place, you all need to engage in an, an exercise of thinking about the impacts of climate change and planning for them. I, I did some work with, um, as I mentioned, part of it with, with Xavier and Fort Hope, some on Fort Southern and a little on Web Webaquay and more on Constance Lake that Bertha could speak about. And part of what, what I did in there was to make up what you can call a, a climate change planning spreadsheet. And 
you can see part of it here, and you may be able to read some of the, the, uh, the entries. Uh, th th these are the community observations, TEK community observations. Talk to your elders, find out what happened in the past, add in details on the, the flooding events, weather events, go to the technical information, so that technical information from the Lake of the Woods uh, Water Authority uh, was, was, is in here. Put in the climate scenarios, in other words, the predictions for the future, and go through a planning exercise which leads to adaptation adaptation options. It's not rocket science. It's, it's easy to think about. It, it takes a bit of time. Uh, talking to all the elders, etc., etc. I've got handouts of this if, if people would like it. So, to my, to my sort of concluding slide. Being prepared means trying to make your communities resilient. Trying to make your communities resilient to change that has begun to happen. These changes began in about 1980. Before 1980, generally in North America, there was a cooling trend. In 1980, 1979, 1980, temperatures began to increase. And you can see that in the, the temperature records from Big Trout Lake, Capas Casing, Moosonee. There are not enough stations in the, the far north, unfortunately, but you can go over to, um, to Manitoba. And, and all of the information shows an increase since, since 19, 1980. And it's continuing. I think every community, and I, I'm admitting to being professorial, ought to have a person in the band office who is charged with gathering climate change data. Talking to elders, looking at the, the temperature records and so forth. And it's not just temperature, but rainfall and all sorts of other parameters. And is the climate change information gatherer. I think every community should have one. And I think they should get together every now and again and they should exchange notes. And it's that way that Martin Falls will find out that Fort Hope had a 1959 flood that maybe was experienced in Martin Falls as well. I think you need to prepare a statement of needs which, which would go to who knows where, a, a new federal government, perhaps, or some other place. <laughs> and not a black hole. For example, your stormwater drainage needs. What does each community need in order to be sure that it will be resilient in the face of the kind of severe rain event that I just spoke about, the Rainy River rain event or the 1950 rain event in, in Fort Hope? I think you need to collaborate. You need to develop the community's climate change narrative, and you need to meet together those climate change information gatherers to exchange stories and to, to put those stories into a narrative, into a, a big story about the impacts that, that climate change has already had on the, uh, on the far north. And then to, to project those into the, uh, the future. You need to think regionally as well as locally. Some adaptation is cleaning your own ditches, but some needs to be regional thinking. You need to think strategically. You need to think about what... what um, what decisions, what adaptations you can make which will bear long-term fruit, which will have long-term benefits, and will spin off other benefits um, uh, as, um, as well. It, it's not just short-term local clean the ditches thinking, it's the regional, the regional thinking that needs to happen as well two and three weeks after the lush green growth because the climate is warming. It's warmer earlier than it used to be, but the caribou, which migrate as days get, get longer, they are driven by, not by temperature. And furthermore, mosquitoes are driven by temperature as well. And there are instances in Greenland where caribou calves have been killed by the amount of blood that's been drawn off them by, uh, by mosquitoes. So it's an, it's, it's an indication of the way that not just communities are experiencing climate change, but the way that ecosystems are experiencing climate change. And you who, are, who live off the land and who, who hunt for, for caribou are those who will know most about what the impacts of climate change on, on caribou are as they, 
as they happen. And the sorts of changes that I just spoke about there seem like small and subtle ones, but they may have huge impacts for the, um, for the herds of caribou on which, which you depend. So, begrudge. At this time, we have a second part to this presentation. I would like to invite Mr. William Sutherland up from Cassetuan First Nation to continue this uh, presentation and the discussion. What's it? What's it? William Sutherland is my cousin. I'm a Mashkego from James Bay. A long time ago, our warriors had big chest muscles and no stomach. That's how powerful we were. But today, we look like cows with big bellies and no, no more uh, no more uh, chest, <laughs> no more muscles. Yesterday when we came down on a road, on a highway, to enter Fort William First Nations, I'd like to thank you for inviting us here. It was the first time I traveled with my brother, Eddie, and all the way from Timmins, I listened to Willie's Roadhouse. And by the time we, we got here, my brother was crying. He was so depressed <laughs> and listening to country music. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about I'm a traditional, traditional elder. I'm a traditional dancer. I attend three lodges. I want to talk about the traditional aspect of climate change. The way I was taught by the grandfathers. When I see the grandfathers, all those who are gone before us, I want to talk about something that you just try to understand. It is something that we need to know what's happening. We are facing a changing world. Our environment started 500 years ago. Our environment problems started 500 years ago. We were the gay curbers. We took care of the land. For many years, it looked so clean. It looked so new. The water we could drink from the river, the air we could breathe. But now everything is changing. Everything is changing. The war is going back to where it used to be. A long time ago, far north used to be like Florida. And slowly it's going back. And it will take a long time to get there the way it used to be. The sun, I spend my time out in the land. My mother spent all her life in James Bay, Norman's Point. She said the Thai water doesn't go back as far as it used to be. It doesn't reach it, it doesn't reach where it used to go. He says, there's more water in James Bay now. We have a cabin in Norman's Point. And uh, polar bears are coming ashore because there's no more ice. My daughter paddled from, uh, from my community all the way to Muslim one time by canoe. And she saw polar bears along the way. They're coming ashore because there's no ice in James Bay. It's changing. 
the birds are changing your pattern of flying south. You're going west now instead of going south. In meetings where I go, an elder told us one time that the dragon is coming. The long knives are coming. They come to your land to take what is yours. And if you know, you, if you know what I'm talking about, the dragons, they're from the east. The long knives are from the south. We have the resources, what the world needs. And they're going to come and take that us. And they're going to destroy our land. They're going to destroy our rivers. A grandfather a long time ago said, you're going to buy water. And that today, that's what we're doing. We're buying water to drink. We cannot drink from the river anymore. And in the future from now, you're going to buy oxygen to breathe. If we're not careful in what we're doing, if we don't take care of our land, we have to protect what is ours. Things are changing so fast for us. The fish are changing. They're adapting to another ways. You know, my brother, one time he brought a book from Timmins, and I look at it and it says, books from North America. And I said, why do you buy that book? You know I have a bird in James Bay? And he says, I see lots of strange birds that come there in the springtime. And we noticed that too. Birds are starting to come there, different kind. Now in James Bay, we have pelicans that we never seen before. We have different animals that come there. One time a trapper, he got a raccoon in his trap. And he didn't know what kind of animal was that. He never seen it before. And he showed it around a community and nobody knew what kind of animal. And I said to him, you ever watch Walt Disney movies? You're going to see that animal in there. <laughs> so we have strange animals and strange, strange uh, things happening. About 10 years ago, the earth shift, the sun doesn't come up where it used to come up. The sun doesn't go down where it used to go down. You won't notice that unless if you live outside and, and unless if you know the sun. You won't notice that if you sp spend your time in rooms like this, or in a city, if you get up after the sunset, you won't know that. But if you spend your time outdoors, trapping, hunting, and if you depend on that sun, it doesn't come up. It's at least three inches off where it used to sunrise. And that three inches is, makes a lot of difference in a big planet. It's three inches off where it used to sun, sunset. And there's a big difference. The grandfathers at the ceremonies say a long time ago, far north, it used to be like Florida. And they find big stumps over there. They find fossils. And it's going to be like that many years from now. You know, these changes it will affect all of us. Back home, I come from a community that floods almost every spring. 
long time ago, we never used to have floods, as far as I, can, I could remember. And in those days, everybody had a canoe. The first flood we had was in 1976. There was ice, lots of ice that spring. And I could remember an elder told me, you better get home. It's going to flood. When I was reaching my house, that ice stopped, and the water just came running over. I could hear people screaming, trying to get home. It was so fast, just a few seconds, and the whole community was flooded. Good thing everybody had a canoe that time. Everybody was floating around. Dogs were floating around. We lost lots of good dogs that year. The last, the last dogs of the hunting season. Then after an, another 10 years, Fort Albany flood had a major flood. Fort Albany is right across the river from us over a big island. They had a big flood. They, they had to fly people over to uh, cash to be flown out. And since that time, I think we're about two or three weeks ahead of the season. I don't know if we're just miscalculating the, ca the uh, calendars or it's a changing season for us. In my own language. A season change is something very serious for us in James Bay. You know, uh, Every year now, we have a big dike around our community. It's about 16, uh, on a down river, 16 feet high, up river is 14 feet high, a dike around the community. One time, during breakup, it almost overflowed it, that ice. And everybody has to be flown out by chopper to Fort Albany so we could be evacuated. It gets very frustrating that you have to evacuate every year. Our hunting seasons for geese is changing too. The geese are coming in a little early. Our travel in Jane's Bay is changing. We used to travel way out in a bay. Now we can't do that no more. The ice is getting thinner. And the grandfathers said that it has something to do the way we live, the things we take for granted. Every time we jump on that vehicle or pull our canoe motor, we are supporting the oil companies that impact our environment. Every time you give that gold ring or that diamond ring to your girlfriend, even if it's only a daughter or diamond ring, <laughs> you're supporting the diamond mines. We are also supporters of everything that's going on. Now they want to build the Ring of Fire in Wipikwe, a big company. And we live downriver, and all this cat lives downriver. And they're going to build a big highway across that Albany River.
in the future we're going to get impacted if something ever happens. There are things under the ground that were not meant to come up to the sun face. That's why they were buried under the ground a long time ago. They're not meant to be on a sun, sun face. But people from the south, they drill holes, big holes, and they bring that stuff up. And that stuff up, it's going to go into the air. It's going to go to the water. Eventually, it's going to come to our communities, destroy our fish. I was a deputy chief for a community and a counselor. I, uh, there are many things to talk about, about our climate change. The grandfather said, you know, today's, today the way we live, if something happens to the modern technology, we'll be lost. What are you going to do if something happens to the computers? Everybody here in this room depends on computers. Everybody, it will affect your way of life. Everybody, iPods. Back home, I have my kids, my grandkids. And everybody's on Facebook. And I cook a big meal. And I wrote that everybody that lives on my house, dinner's ready. Everybody comes running down. I knew that uh, everybody's always on Facebook. <laughs> and when the power goes off, everybody panics. And my uh, grandkid told me, hey, Musho, you got a generator at the shed? Go get it. <laughs> you know, that's how, uh, that's how, how much effect it has on us now. In the rivers where we live, it's getting drier every year. The land is expanding rapidly out into the bay. The places where we used to travel, we cannot travel there no more. Because the, uh, just like my uh, friend there said, the land is rising slowly. Oh yeah, by the way, I told my brother on the way down, David, I can't remember David. He says, sure, you remember him? The, uh, you were in a meeting together in Timmins. No, I told him, I can't. Well, he's that guy that looks like Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if I knew I was going to do a presentation, I was going to put something on uh, modern technology there, I'm not too good at it. I would have show you my community, how it looks when it uh, floods, how it looks when breakup comes along. You know, back to the rivers, uh, that's the kind of person around, I keep jumping all over the place. Back to the rivers, we have a barge system that brings in our supplies. And our rivers are, uh, there's some places where uh, I don't think it goes to Albany anymore because the river is shallow. And uh, we got a letter from uh, MTL, it's a barge company, telling that in the future they cannot come to cash anymore because the rivers are shallow and the uh, the sandbars are building up because of the breakup. And uh, 
we talk about the old old season road, but to to me that's a bad bad idea. To myself, anyway, because we have one of the the best rivers in James Bay, Fort Albany River. I let my daughter paddle down one time. It took her 14 days, eight canoes, to paddle down the Albany River. And she said it's a beautiful country. Only two rapids, two small rapids, that's it. And they paddled down from Karstock to Cash, 14 days. And my older daughter, she paddled along James Bay, and that's where she encountered polar bears. You know, I wouldn't like to see, uh, I wouldn't like to see uh, all season road come up that way. Why destroy our land? We are, we are an isolated community. So, uh, no, so that's what I want to say. That someday your great, great, great grandkids they're not going to see what we see today if we don't stop what we're doing. We have to stop. And maybe someday we don't have to buy oxygen to breathe. It's going to happen. Because a long time ago, our grandfathers told us, someday you're going to buy water. And it's happening now. Now they're talking about finding new planets. What are they going to do if they find a new planet? They're going to do what they did to us? Or are they going to fly over and put a flag? Well, I'm going to claim it for uh, somebody. <laughs> You know, it's pretty, pretty amazing when we get here together, especially with David there talking away. And I believe most of, most of it is happening today. So uh, with that, I just want to speak a little bit. I don't want to take much of your time. I'm not much of a speaker, but I could speak all I want in politics if, I, if they ask me to speak in politics. But climate change is kind of different. My brother, Eddie there, he works on uh, land use planning to protect our uh, our various sites, he's going to talk about that tomorrow. And maybe he's going to have some pictures of our land in James Bay. And also, uh, just think about it. You have to change, too. You have to. If you don't, Something bad is going to happen. Something very bad is going to happen. In our ceremonies, the grandfathers always talk about bad things that's going to happen. And I believe them. I really believe them. And things are starting to happen already. They say that the uh, modern technology will run our lives. Just one push of a button and it will destroy our environment. Worst, worst imagination that you ever can think of. 
Just one little button. That's it. That's why we all have to live together. That's why all of us have to become humans again. I wish I could talk teachings, teach us lots about history. You know, uh, fishes are changing very slowly. When we, we have the beers, where we come from. Man, those guys, if you tell them about the environment, it's just like they don't have ears. They don't care about you. We have our trap line along that winter road. We ask them to do something. They don't do it. So you people from Upeque, if you want information about the beers, you go see the people of Arabaskat. You go talk to the people of Cash and Albany, and they will tell you stories about them. They will tell you stories that they agree to, but they never keep their promise. So you people from that region, I just want to inform you, you better, you better do something. Because those mining companies, they will destroy your land. They will destroy your way of living. They will destroy your waters, your lakes. And I've seen it. Even a little bit, I've seen it. I've seen where the uh, where the winter road goes go across. I've seen that where the fishes are frozen solid to the river, where the beavers beaver are dried up and they die on a on the uh, on the south side of the ro road. And talk about agreements. They will never honor your agreement. Maybe to give you enough to make you satisfied and go home. That's all they do. And I think uh, lunch is ready. I don't know what's, what's for lunch. I think it's sardines or something. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you all of you for uh, listening. Miigwech. Kinanas komit to know. Watch it.